Our guests today are Sean Snaith, and Stuart Fullerton. We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. One of the best forms of birth control is economic growth um, because what demographers have found is that as, as an economy grows, as it becomes more wealthy, um, fertility decisions are affected by this and, and, and people tend to have fewer children. Uh, and so for example, Europe, population growth is, is really ground to a halt. Uh, and in the Has U.S., it? it's I got, didn't know that. Yeah, in the U.S., it's it's slowed down significantly as well. If you look at if, if family no, size, I didn't know that. If you look at family size, it's gotten a lot smaller. I mean, uh, maybe when you were growing up, you know, eight nine kids was not that big of a, a, a no, a but family. a lot of them died too. Well, okay, th that that may be true, but now I mean, it would just be com it's completely shocking. Uh, to me, when I meet someone that has, you know, five kids, mm -hmm. let alone mm -hmm. eight or nine, mm -hmm. um, just because of time and the, uh, the opportunity cost of time and the resources that it takes. Uh, so as, as these economies develop, then they tend to have fewer children per family. And I think that, you know, that lowers the trajectory a little bit. And then you've got, you know, disease, okay. famine. But when, things when that, e that even, even at this stage of the game, um, our, our growth seems to be, as I see it, every time I go out and see another tree has just disappeared or another acre has been turned into a coming soon department store thing. If the population is getting smaller or holding its own, even in the United States, how can we continue to build all this stuff? Uh, well, I mean, growth... Who's going to fill it up? <laughs> well, the, the, I mean, if we're talking about different sectors, I mean, if, if population growth suddenly stopped... Uh, then you know the housing stock wouldn't necessarily need to grow as much as it uh -huh. uh, does when the population is growing, for example. But the output of the economy can still grow because, as I said, productivity, uh, innovation allows us to get more out of the existing scarce resources that we have. So it doesn't just have to come from making more people. Um, we can, you know, do things uh, in a better way, get mm -hmm. more out of these. You know, still cut down a tree, but let's get more out of it uh, as a result or find ways to, to make more of them um, mm -hmm. through, you know, genetic or whatever uh, mm -hmm. biological advances we might, we might, uh, might discover along the way. So, I mean, I think that ingenuity and, and problem solving and creativity and, and our ability to, to become more productive mm -hmm. um, solves a lot of those, uh, those issues, and that does help drive uh, the ability to produce more. Mm -hmm. uh, in the work you're doing on the UCF campus and um, w when you're studying uh, and um, I think somewhere uh, in our conversations um, you pointed out to me that there were 12 uh, areas in Florida growth in the Orlando and, and Tampa St. Pete and Naples I think you said is considered one of them and Miami and and um, ah, let's see if I can remember I'm old <laughs> I'm young, and sometimes you know, I can't. I've been out and had a sandwich. <laughs> okay, well, we can put something up on the screen here that will list the 12 and rescue <laughs> us both. But uh, these are metro areas, so these are sub areas within the state that are okay. uh, fairly developed economies in and of themselves. And they're all different. Gainesville's different from Gainesville, from Orlando, yeah. and and Miami's different from Pensacola, and and the structure of those economies mm -hmm. are different, and the industries that are more prevalent in each of those economies are different. And so. Um, you know, we're all in the same boat, but different parts of the boat can move in different ways depending on, you know, what, what, what's happening with a wave. So, mm -hmm. you know, some national shock that occurs in the U.S. economy might have a different effect in, in Pensacola than it has okay. in Orlando. And so we try are to you strictly or Florida-oriented, or are you also southeastern United States, or the, what I guess they call the eastern corridor up and down the... Uh, or, 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 I mean, our forecasts. The, we we produce forecasts for the for the nation as a whole, a U.S. forecast okay. each quarter. That feeds into our state forecast. So we do a forecast for the entire state of Florida as a whole. Now who and does then, who does the national forecast go to? Um, What's well, distributed? Have no, idea. no, okay. It, it's uh, I'm going to tell you. Printed, published. It's <laughs> printed. Yeah, it's printed. Uh, it's also uh, in PDF form oh, electronically. Oh, right. So save a few trees. <laughs> I was I, I was going to give you a copy after the taping, but uh, I think once you see that glossy uh, 
Classy. Uh, I'll take that right into the bug <laughs> closet and see how long before I fall asleep. Well, it's a non-addictive sleep aid. Oh, that's okay. for sure. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the U.S. forecast goes out to, uh, we send it out to, to uh, our mailing list, uh, the, the, the predictions and the numbers that are in are included in uh, a number of national panels, uh, the uh, Livingston Survey, the Philadelphia Fed uh, Reserve Survey of Professional Forecasters, USA Today has Does a forecast. Does our friend in Washington get a copy? Uh, we do send it to our, 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 our politicians, our friends in <laughs> government, uh, <laughs> our friends in the private sector, yes, our, our friends in the foundation and trustees. Okay. And so mm -hmm. friends at the university get copies of it. Right. And uh, really, uh, we get requests and we get on our website, we have people from around uh, around the country that uh, mm -hmm. download these publications and take a look at it. So, so you can apply for grants. You get you get paid uh, for the funding. Uh, in biology, they all uh, to the, today's trend is to you have to get a grant to go study something to hire your student. Blah 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 blah. I, and that's a good question. How do you fund yourself? Uh, right now, we're uh, we're funded by the College of Business, okay. uh, and we also get a significant amount of funding from Orange County. Uh, oh, it was right. uh, Mayor Crotty, I think five years ago, I might be wrong on the history, had a, an economic stimulus package that mm -hmm. he, he proposed, and, and the Institute for Economic Competitiveness was one, one element of this. And so Orange County has been a big uh, supporter of, uh, of the Institute, mm -hmm. and they, they mm -hmm. continue to be, uh, even in this environment of uncertainty that was, that was caused by the property tax uh, oh. discussions yes. and now change that came out of, or is coming out of Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If 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 I was, um, gosh, I don't know any of the major businesses that, that are in Central Florida, Florida. But but if I had a company that was producing a product, would I come to you to to say what are my chances of this product being appropriate, or where would I go with it? Is it that kind of a thing, or to do me a study to see? I don't know. I, I, I really don't. I have no clue. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Let me, let me address that. Well, we wouldn't uh, uh, provide advice about a specific product per okay. se. Uh, we could help characterize the market as a whole. As a whole. Um, you know, it's, you, you talked about when you were younger looking through a microscope at insects. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're not at, at the microscope. We're more of a, a satellite view uh, okay. from a, maybe not satellite height, but 30,000 feet. And we're, we're looking at, at the big, bigger picture of okay. uh, job creation and personal income and gross state product. Mm -hmm. um, financial markets, things like that, that affect these business decisions. But uh, we're not an invention evaluation service okay. or something like that. There, there are, uh, within the College of Business uh, Institutes, that are more geared to an entrepreneur that mm -hmm. might have an idea mm -hmm. for, for, for a new product. But I guess um, there's a whole think tank of that downtown someplace, isn't there? Yeah, there's, there's a small business development center, which is run uh, by the College of Business Administration. There's the uh, National Entrepreneurial Center. Okay, and you feed your uh, There's information a Center for Innovation on campus, okay, and right. so th they work more with the individual entrepreneur. Uh, uh, we, you know, co development companies, uh, banks, uh, anyone that's, that's taking a bigger view of a particular market, um, our studies can kind of help provide the, lay out those, those big foundations. If they want to get down to the, the smaller components, then, then that's not exactly what we do, but we can kind of set the, the broader parameters. You know, we think this metro area is going to have this many people and this many jobs in these industries uh, in the year 2020. Based on that, you know, how much of your particular product could you uh, okay. expect to sell? So it's kind of, it gives them a foundation more than than a, a specific How'd analysis. How did you get into this as a young man in Philadelphia, growing up in Philadelphia? Well, I don't like Philadelphia because I'm from Pittsburgh. But uh, <laughs> uh, began with a P, didn't it? <laughs> it did. I'm close. Them's his fighting words where same, I come same from. Same side of the Mississippi River and north <laughs> of the line. I think. <laughs> All you Californians are like that. You, uh, um, you probably you probably got one of those shiny dimes off J.P. Morgan's floor where he used to have you polish them all day. I don't know. I, I couldn't get that job. Uh, well, I grew up in Pittsburgh and uh, in the 1970s, and this was a time uh, when uh, 
uh, outsourcing was taking place, although they didn't call it outsourcing then. It was uh, the steel industry was in decline. Okay. Um, jobs were being lost to, to more efficient, uh, less costly methods of production in, in the Korea at the time. Um, and so all these big mills that Pittsburgh was known for was, was shutting down and mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. friends, fathers, and, and my family was affected indirectly by the closing of these mills. And so I saw a lot of, uh, you know, people that went from kind of a nice middle class existence into, you know, And that poverty. certainly hasn't changed at all, has it? Uh, in terms of that transition occurring? Yeah. I, I understand it better. And, and getting back to the original question, I didn't really know why all these things were happening, you mm -hmm. know, as a youngster. I didn't understand inflation. I didn't know why the line at the gas station was so long and why we could only go on an odd day and not an even day. And, you know, you know, why is the steel company firing people? Why would they do that to people? Mm -hmm. These people need mm -hmm. jobs. And um, so I think that that kind of planted the seed. And then I mm -hmm. thought I was going to be a doctor and started in a pre-med uh, program at a liberal arts uh, uh, school in Pennsylvania, and we were forced to take courses from across uh, across the disciplines. And mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. took a writing section that was uh, in macroeconomics, and had a really great teacher, uh, Dr. Adams, and um, Earl the Pearl. We called him Earl Adams. What a um, neat name! What a neat name! Yeah, he was he was a, he was a neat guy, and he was very interested in it, and he did a good job explaining it and all those things kind of resurfaced and all uh -huh. those questions and I was like, yeah, I want to know this. And I thought, well, if I get a PhD in economics, then I'll really know everything. And then that was the, the real disappointment was that <laughs> I got it. I'm like, wait, I still don't know anything. Yeah, I still don't know everything. I've been Higher cheated. And deeper and there you are. I've been cheated. I've been cheated. But I, it okay. did give me a set of tools that I use to this day. You got your, your, to, your PhD up there also? I went to uh, Penn State, uh, Pennsylvania okay. as well. Right. So. Um, and that's kind of how I got into it. You know, I've had had that question asked to me before, and I, you know, I joked, "Well, I, I didn't get accepted into Cowboy College, so I had to become an economist." But uh, <laughs> it's not one of those things you dream about as a kid, I suppose. Well, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't want to use the term robber barons, but they managed to do very well. <laughs> and uh, and there's a whole, you know, there's a whole new thing. Gosh, there's a whole train of thought that goes off into the, the philosophy of life and the way the folks lived. Uh, um, in the days of, of, of what we loosely call the robber barons and the pine barons and all the rest of those folks. Um, a whole sociological thing, a whole other topic of conversation. There have been some wonderful books over the years dealing with that. Did you see those kinds of changes in your childhood also? Uh, what, Probably what not by the 70s, Well, no, I mean, no, that that's all gone. Yeah, gone, I mean, gone. I went to the... I, I, Went to the Carnegie Museum, for example, as, as a <laughs> well, young person, okay. and that kind of flowed sure, out of, uh, sure. of that, that historical period. But I mean, that region was shaped by that. There's no doubt. You know, a lot of these men made made their made their fortunes yeah. in uh, in that part of the country. Uh, you know, you talked earlier about quality of life, or we, am I interested in quality of life? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's one of those things that um, you know, gross domestic product growth doesn't necessarily translate or capture uh, quality of life. And I think quality was, is like good and bad. It depends on where you are and who you are. Right. And uh, what it is. And these, this is a component of it, of course. Right. If you don't have a job, this is going to affect your quality of sure. life here. But sure. you know, I think uh, John Muir said at one point, we all need beauty, and and you know. My numbers, I know that, don't, don't capture that, and they're uh, oh, detached from it. Oh, but a lot of people are doing. Math and numbers are very, very important. Absolutely. One of my very good friends is, is uh, uh, math is his thing. Uh, uh, he does computers and he does math. But uh, laughingly, uh, coming over to the studio today, I don't know what we were talking about, he says, well, surely we can make a quadratic equation out of that whole thing, which is not the same thing you do, but you do use that kind of math, I'm sure, and you're projecting much more math than that uh, in your we, projection. We do. We do, um, the models that we use are, are, are sets of mathematical mm -hmm. equations that, uh, you know, it's kind of a, what we, what I grew up with playing with called an erector set. I mean, it's oh, kind of built yes, together. Yes, <laughs> You know, it's all put together this way, and uh, it, it keeps things in check because it forces certain things to add up yeah. to some total, yeah. and it also allows us to model behavioral patterns that we've mm -hmm. seen in, in mm -hmm. past data. Um, but, you know, I, I also can play God, so to speak, and shape where these things go, and so mm -hmm. a lot of intuition. and Do a and lot of computer work, then, in what you're doing. I do spend a lot of time in front of the computer. Because you used one of those fascinating words, modeling. 
Right. And biology people do a lot of modeling too, right. uh, which which is kind of the same thing you're talking about, really, in, in the whole business. Yeah. Well, uh, it's definitely changed the way uh, things have done. The amount of power that you have sitting on yeah, your, your desktop yeah. is it's amazing. It absolutely is amazing. Absolutely amazing. It is amazing. When you when you look at Florida, Ed, do you do you ever compare it to your home state, or do you ever compare what you're seeing here? to where you were at the college, uh, University of Pacific, now out there in, in California, the Central Valley there? I do, I, I do, you know, I, in, in, in different ways. I, I think what's transpired and is transpiring in California is very applicable to what's happening now in Florida. Well, it seems geographically it is almost. They're two very long states, and if you ignore <laughs> the panhandle, sorry about that, folks, in the panhandle. <laughs> But you look at California, and, and and I would say automatically Sacramento, Davis mess, the the Stockton, California stuff, the Fresno stuff at the bottom, San Diego at the very bottom, Los Angeles coming up to Carmel and the retirement centers, and up to San Francisco. Uh, I'm sorry, there's something up north. I would I guess the Chico region, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure about that. Eureka, well, it's back. Eureka, uh, yeah. you're seeing the same kind of distribution you're seeing in Florida. It, it's a big state. Um, the, we're experiencing the uh, real estate um, appreciation mm -hmm. now that, that California has been dealing with for some time. And, mm -hmm. and that shapes patterns both in terms of uh, population growth and migration into and out of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, California has experienced a, a, a migration from the coastal areas to the interior of the mm -hmm. state because real estate is so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of Californians pack up their home equity and they head to Idaho and they head to Oregon and they head to Montana. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm starting to see and, and uh, hear anecdotes of things like that happen now in Florida where people pack up their home equity and they go to the Carolinas or Tennessee. Really? Um, coastal areas are very expensive to live and, and mm -hmm. that's going to start pushing development to the interior of the state. That mm -hmm. and perhaps the hurricane issue and property, mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. tax. But... Um, so I see a lot of parallels there. Um, the, the recent housing price appreciation, California kind of went into that cycle ahead of Florida. Uh, so Florida was still kind of peaking after California had started mm -hmm. the, the downturn here. So I, I watch what's going on there to, to try to get some insight as to what's happening You think here. Florida is leveling off or, or, or uh, continuing? It, it, it is. I don't think it's uh, as, as uh, apocalyptic as some people painted. Uh, I think for another 20 market. years or so, things will kind of continue to... I, I mean, I think the current glut in another year and a half will have worked itself down, and then I think we'll get into some normalcy. I, I think both the current period in, in, in housing and, and the, mm -hmm. the, the period of the past two years, uh, both were aberrations. These were not, these were abnormal times. Which says that we're going to come back to what I was asking right. originally, this sort of a steady state kind of a I, I, th I think we're going to get into that, uh, mm -hmm. more of a steady state rate of growth, both in terms of price appreciation and starts, mm -hmm. uh, middle mm -hmm. of 2008. 2009. Mm -hmm. um, what about Pennsylvania? Well, you know, again, we talked about population as a driver. Uh, population in Pennsylvania is, is pretty stagnant, and that's uh, been some challenges for cities like Pittsburgh as well that mm -hmm. have struggled as of late again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they went through the cycle with the, the steel industry, and then there was a renaissance, and um, now they're having, having some, some financial difficulties uh, once again. But Do you here, see any change in Florida occurring? Um, I'm going way out to ask this uh, as we continue to Florida. Uh, my opinion is we're getting a lot of old folks like me in Florida. Is this going to make a big change? Uh, I think we'll we continue certainly need to. that new med school. Maybe by the time they air this thing, the med school will be done, built, and they'll have a geriatric unit, and I'll be in there. But <laughs> as long as you're not there as a cadaver, right? We, we don't, we don't, we yes, don't. better to be seen than viewed. <laughs> um, I think that's going to continue a trend that'll continue. I mean, when uh, you know we've got. 78, 77 million uh, baby boomers. Um, the front end of them are, are just hitting mm -hmm. the early 60s, tail end of them uh, in their early 40s. Uh, the, where they're going to retire, they're not going to uh, you know, Bismarck, North Dakota for their retirement no, for choices. For the same reason you're down here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I, I don't miss scraping windows in February mornings and slipping on the sidewalk and things like that. That you know, I, I'll I'll take the love bugs and the sand uh, and salt and yes. the sand and salt. But uh, uh, so you know, places like Arizona and and Nevada and, and uh -huh. Florida will continue to draw sure. uh, these retirees. Uh, so that's that's another twenty years of of, of 
you know, retiree influx. You folks in your in your work, are you looking at anything uh, uh, which is certainly not necessarily a biological concept, but a, a environmental situation? What we're going to do about water in Florida? Uh, th there is some talk do about. You have some that. programming um, in that, some modeling as to our waters and that I, kind I, of economic I, thing. There, there are some economists that do work in environmental and resource economics, and that is becoming a, uh, an issue that I do hear a lot more about. Right now, it's not something that I'm acutely aware of or, mm -hmm. or I'm trying to model specifically mm -hmm. within, within it. But, uh, um, you know, how, how do you handle the growing population and their needs uh, for water? I mean, I guess I'm just learning a lot about uh -huh. what Florida's like. I didn't know that Florida burned like it did in the summertime, and that was a surprise <laughs> to me. Um, That's normal. <laughs> That's very now, now I know. Yeah. Um, But, you know, there, there's been some talk. There were these groups, I don't know, uh, How Shall You Grow? Maybe you've seen some of the work that, mm. that they were doing. They were looking at Florida. Well, they started off looking at Central Florida, and then the same group looked at the state as a whole, you know, in, in, in 2060. You know, what's it going to look like? Uh, mm -hmm. Where's the development going to be? Uh, how are all these people going to be housed? How are all these people going to have, mm -hmm. have water? Um, one of the issues that they, they uh, brought up that, you know, I think I've seen in the Caribbean and makes some sense is the, is the rooftop cisterns. I was down um, there for Christmas, yes. Everybody has the cisterns up on the roof. Why not? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I could see it getting to that point, but again, it's going to be driven by, by well, the economics. I have a friend who lives up in Louisville, and that's where she gets her water, up on the top of the hill. As all, of the eave, uh, all, the, all the drains in the eaves go down in this huge underground system. And it keeps her swimming pool going, and it keeps her going. She has oh, a wow. wonderful indoor swimming pool. And all of it comes out of cistern water oh, that comes out of the roof. I think she was telling me once that there was one year where the cistern went dry, and they had to haul good knows how many thousands of gallons in in a big tanker and fill the thing back up again. Yeah, but, that's not fun when that uh, happens. But, you know, it, we, we respond as, as individuals and I think as, as governments and, and communities. A price is a driver. Um, like, yeah. Look at gasoline and what happened. You know, we talked about the 1970s. What happened mm -hmm. in the 1970s? Well, we had the OPEC oil embargoes and energy prices went through the roof and we were all driving these large uh, automobiles made in Detroit that got seven or eight miles to the gallon. And uh, all of a sudden here comes Japanese automakers with mm -hmm. their, their compacts mm -hmm. and subcompacts and fuel efficiency. You know, who ever thought of that? High, you know, high mileage. And so Detroit took a beating and lost market share and uh, wised up a little bit and, and, and eventually got back on its feet. And then the real price of gas started to fall again. And we started to see the emergence of, of large SUVs and Hummers. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, you know, deja vu all over again. Uh, then gas shot up in the, in the wake of Hurricane uh, Katrina and it's stayed mm -hmm. elevated. Mm -hmm. uh, um, again, Detroit suffering, um, and, and people are thinking about hybrids and, and smaller, more fuel-efficient uh, uh, vehicles. So, you know, as the cost of water rises, as the price of water rises, and treating water and providing water, then that will start Economically, to, it will encourage industries to... Yeah. I, uh, I got caught up into some of this here within this last year, looking at, at the uh, electricity again. And thought, well, thanks to the hurricanes of whatever those years were that we have them and the loss of my trees over my house, why don't I just put huge solar panels up there and convert my old house into a completely solar operative thing? I, and they're doing a lot of this in California, I think, yes. now, where people are, are, are putting in huge arrays up on the roof where they can't be seen and then putting excess electricity back into the power grid. Um, but by the time I got the price... Even with the tax write-offs and all of these things, I would have to stay alive and operate that house for another 40 years to break even. So I turned off another light bulb instead. Instead, yeah. But, well, go ahead. I, I mean, we talked about this, how do you handle growing population? Yeah. And I, mean, I think I, I'm a big believer in the innovation and creativity of, mm -hmm. of of mm -hmm. humanity. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I think we have an incredible ability to, to solve problems. Does the, the, the engineering community, because we always laugh over in the biology building that, um, that the business people in the engineering building all tend to share the same buildings. There's there's CIBA 1, CIBA 2, CIBA 3. And it is, it is physically CIBA attached. Nine. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't really, we have a joke that if you can't make it in engineering, they shove the records down the chute into the business department, which I know you're going to deny immediately. Go ahead and say no. No, it's a dumbwaiter. It's not oh, a shoe. Okay. 
<laughs> but do you, do you do, back to a question that I think you've already answered. Do okay. the people from engineering come over and say, what do you see in these projections and, and look for things to direct their students in for, for their advanced degrees to go into these things? Not as much. Not, not as much? Not as much. I haven't had those conversations myself per se. Uh, I mean, th those. Um, we need to get some engineering people in here to talk to you. Well, maybe. I, uh, you may become a star on Jerry's show someday. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully not today. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go home. Um, you know, wh whether they use those, uh, those projections or those forecasts, uh, I, can't, I can't say for sure. But I think when they go out you know, in, into the world and they're working for the, these engineering they're gonna companies, see them. then they're going to see them. Yeah. Uh, and, and it will affect their, their decision making. On, a, on an undergraduate level, do engineering students have to have a certain amount of business courses? Is this something where you can get in and influence the student at an undergraduate level? I don't know what the requirements are in terms of the curriculum okay. of the engineer. I, I think they should. I mean, I, I'm a bit biased. I also, sure, as we I talked about, why. I came from, a, came from a liberal arts background, and I'm mm -hmm. all in favor mm -hmm. of a, of a broad-based mm -hmm. uh, education, mm -hmm. and certainly anybody living and working in a democracy should have some basic understanding of economics, I believe, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and certainly most of their careers, if not their personal life as well, you know, these, this information is going to come in handy. Sure. Um, so what they're required to take, I can't say for sure, but uh, you know, typically it, it, it... Where do you see your area going in the next 20 to 30 years? You're new, you're young, you're to the university, you've got 30 years to go. Before uh, they drum you out, or <laughs> they, they, well, yeah, they, they well, probably get rid of me sooner than that. Where do you see, or how would you like to see it go? What's um, the sense I, of I mean, direction? I could talk more broadly in terms of the, you're talking about what I do. Either you or the institute that you're offer, oh. that, that you're responsible I for. Mean, I mean, what I would like to see, and one of the reasons I came here was that uh, when I was in California, I was doing a, a pretty much the same thing: a mm -hmm. national forecast, a, a statewide mm -hmm. forecast, and, and a forecast for some metro areas. And I was always competing with. Uh, the UCLA mm -hmm. Anderson forecast, mm -hmm. which was sort of the, the, the de facto um, gold standard of, of forecasts in the state. That's what I'd like the Institute's forecast to be and mm -hmm. when 